Welcome to session number three of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford. My name is Burton Lee. Today is January 29, and we're very pleased to present a full session on Estonia, a little bit on the Baltics, with four rock stars from the Estonian startup and political scene, featuring former President Thomas Hendrik Ilvis, Ati Henla, who is CEO, co-CEO and co-founder of Starship Technologies Robotics. We're going to be playing with this a little bit. Where's our driver? Driver's up front. Um, uh, also featuring Reiner Sternfeld, who's spoken previously in our course, uh, saying a few, few words about his experience uh, building startups between Estonia and Silicon Valley. And then Andres Vierg, where's Andres, who's director and former partner of ours from Enterprise Estonia Silicon Valley. So we're very pleased to welcome our speakers today. Um, President Ilvis, thank you for coming uh, 300 yards from the Hoover Institution all, all this way. <laughs> uh, we're pleased to have you here in the Bay Area with us for, how long are you, are you here for? One End or two of years? June. Sorry? End of June. End of June. Um, thank you for saying a few words and giving us a broader context about the Estonian uh, innovation scene, what you've been doing in e-government over the last few years, and why Estonia has taken a leadership position in Europe around ICT innovation. So if we could please welcome President Ilvis. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be able to continue uh, my, uh, my job that I had for 10 years and before that another 10 of bragging about my country. And so that's what I will do today. But basically, if you want, I mean, my, my whole talk can be summed up uh, in, with the following sentence, that uh, innovation in digital across the world really comes down to four things. Political will, policies that come from that, laws that come out of the policies, and the regulations that then enable you to, to create an environment that uh, allows uh, things to happen. And I would argue this is all across the board, be it governance or e-governance or with the, uh, uh, the ecology for entrepreneurship. But I will focus today, just so you get an idea of where much of this stuff came out of in my country, on more on the governance side, where Estonia today is um, ranked number one in Europe in e-governance, by far ahead of anyone else. And what I also am quite proud of is on top of that, it is uh, number one according to the ITU uh, for European, for security, cybersecurity in Europe. And the third factor which comes into this is around the world number one in freedom online. How you uh, manage to do, accomplish all those when people have all kinds of arguments while about, well, you have to give up freedom in order to have security or e-governance sort of reduces your privacy, all those things uh, I leave to other people to explain. Background for Estonia, why it is that originally we became, I mean, this is the, we ended up doing a lot in high tech, and I would say this was kind of the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times was, if you go back and look at the GDP of, uh, GDPs before the war, in 1938, the last year before World War II, Finland, our neighbor to the north, and Estonia had identical GDP per capita. Identical. When we became independent in 1991, or again independent, 1991 after Soviet, Nazi, and Soviet occupations, there was, depending on which figures you use, either a nine-fold or a 13-fold difference in GDP per capita between Finland and Estonia. Uh, so this was quite a dismal situation here. There you were, 91, 92, 93, and we were, like, we were a developing country. And our cousins in the north, we speak a kind of mutually unintelligible language, um, were 9 to 12, to uh, 13 times richer than each of us. Uh, now looking at the situation fairly dismal, I go, what are we going to do? You know very well that it's going to be uh, decades before you catch up with all of the infrastructure that wasn't built, that you, you know, create all the, create all the laws and, the, and just basically turn your country back to where it should have been, had there not been all those occupations. 
And it struck me, at least, and I think some other people, that um, uh, actually, for me, I can tell you very exactly what happened. One was that um, I learned to code as a 13-year-old or 14-year-old in, in New Jersey. Um, so that, would have been, that was 50 years ago now. And um, the other thing was a 93 summer mosaic came out, the first web browser, which you had to buy, and then you had to sort of shove in all of the floppies to get it, to get it into your computer, and which I did, because I was kind of geeky. And uh, I looked at this thing, and it was a web browser, and you could look at you know, a thousand pages at that time, but I looked at this, I said, this is something where no matter how backward my country is, it is still starting out on a level playing field, field with the very best, i.e. the United States. And so why don't we put efforts into that? And I talked to a bunch of people. The other people had come upon the same idea. And we actually ended up with a bunch of people thinking, well, maybe we should focus on digitization. This met huge opposition. I mean, I made a proposal to, to computerize the schools and connect them all up. And basically, for about a year, the teachers' union weekly devoted a page to blasting me and throwing me the rotten tomatoes in the every weekly edition, which was kind of fun. Anyway, so this, th these things, I mean, an analogous things were going on, I mean, in the tech field where people were, you know, the, we had a fairly strong already uh, IT system for, at the university of people studying computer science. And there were some other, there were politicians, I was not a politician yet then, uh, who were also sort of intrigued by this idea and basically what ended up happening, there was kind of a confluence of, of, um, of thinking and slowly and surely, step by step, we started creating the legal environment that would enable tech to take off. What year did, what year did you come up with Skype? End of 2002. Okay, all right. I want them to move ahead. I mean, it's basically a couple of things happen at once. Um, uh, so basically, where we were, by 97, 98, all Estonian schools were online and at computer labs, which were then open to the public in after, after hours, which led to kind of a kind of diffusion of the idea of IT into the public. Now, let me just see how I'm doing on time, so I don't, all right, I'm normally, I'm taking too much time. Basically. We got to the point where at the end of, uh, 19, uh, the, of the 90s, we realized this was the way to go, but this would require some strong governmental action. And so at the, we, late 99, 2000, roughly, the government at the time agreed that what we really need is to create a digital identity on, for, I mean, a secure digital identity with a chip card with two-factor authentication end-to-end -end encryption, which would, and then ultimately the goal being to put all, all services, government services, but with the strong input of the private sector, mainly the banks that wanted the same thing, to ac actually do this as a public-private partnership. So in 2001, we rolled out our digital identity system, card-based originally, also now, soon thereafter, also on mobile. Uh, the, um, we, there was from the outset, again, due to our poverty, a distributed data exchange layer, which gave a huge boost to security. If you're interested, you can go onto YouTube. I mean, so get, get a three minute video on how it works. But if you go into YouTube and you put X road, and there's in, in, and in parentheses, uh, long, or short or long, I think long version, but it's only three and a half minutes that explains how a, digi digi how a distributed data exchange layer works, but gives a huge increase in security and that allows actually digitization to proceed without having centralized databases, which is actually a key to many of the problems that has, have infected or affected the world round, be it the OPM hack here in the United States, with 23 million uh, people's federal employees, uh, personal data stone, Equifax, go on and on. I mean, Equifax obviously had very other had other problems, but we got to the point where uh, there are only three three things in life where you interact with the government in any form. 
uh, that you have to do in person. Uh, one is when you get married. The second, and mainly for security reasons, it's um, a sale of real estate, which uh, you do have to show up, which, uh, you know, people say, why that? Well, I mean, if you look at the number of shell companies in the United States and the UK allowing people to buy all kinds of stuff from anywhere from Trump Tower to Miami uh, without knowing who's buying it, uh, and behind that there are Russian oligarchs, or worse, um, you see why you want to actually show up to show that you're real and it's not a shell company. And then, of course, the third thing, you also have to show up for both sides, not only marriage, but if you get divorced. Other than that, you have to do, I mean, you can do anything online. Register your car, you don't have to spend three days at the DMV to register your car. Um, and I checked into that and you're wrong. You do not have to d register an, an NGO in person. So you were fed something. Anyway, so here we are. So how am I doing on my time? So here we are uh, in um, 2000 and whatever we are, 2018. Uh, this system has been in place for 17 years and it has not been hacked or breached yet. It has been overwhelmed by a massive DDoS attack in 2007, but that is not getting into anything, and so far we are blessed with that. Now that's the government side of thing that created this environment. The other thing that is crucial, and you're very fortunate to have him here to, uh, to speak to, is there are four then kids, how old are you now? No, no, but you were pretty young. You were in your 20s when uh, Ahti Hainla, who uh, can, has continued to innovate and not simply cashed in and become a venture capitalist, uh, sorry, <laughs> I like some other people, uh, who, and who is uh, the person who brings you this thing. But there were four kids in Estonia that, uh, then kids, guys in their 20s, who came out with the first voice over internet protocol a uh, commercial product also known today as Skype, um, which became an instant success the world around. I mean, all kinds of people have bought it since, and, uh, but I, I assume you got a pretty good deal out of it. But in, in any case, Skype, aside from becoming this phenomenon, and that has led to all kinds of other voiceover in a protocol system, but this was the first one, and so immediately took off. It had a, a dramatic effect in the country, which was that this little country that everyone thought is like cold, miserable, damp, and you know, a, a backwater of a backwater uh, in Europe, which anyway is considered a tech backwater, suddenly became a worldwide brand. And the effect on young people was amazing in that suddenly STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, became cool for a lot of people. And this was the social effect of the success of Skype. Uh, and we've been reaping the rewards ever since. So I always am grateful to the four guys who did Skype. Um, so where are we today? Well, I mean, where, if, if you want to get a really good picture of what Estonia is like today, there was in the first couple of weeks of um, December, what to my mind is the best article ever written in English about Estonia. Uh, just Google the New Yorker and the Digital Republic. And in that there's a long article about how all of this works and what is going on there. So that is, I mean, it's far better than for me to go into a long description of it. You might as well read someone who actually went there as a skeptic and decided to write about how it all works. So please do that if you want to know about Estonia. Finally, to, to basically tell you how it feels, um, and this is something uh, I think will be echoed by a number of my uh, compatriots who are in, uh, in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, is a contrast between the United States and my little country, which is that um, this, this, I came here because this is the mecca of IT. I mean, this is the place to be, Silicon Valley. 
in a 10 mile radius, there's Facebook, there's Google, there's Tesla, I mean, there's, there's Apple. And I've been using Apple since 1982. So all of this is here, not to mention, you know, up there on the hill, there, I guess, uh, Sand Hill Road that publishes, all, I mean, that pays for all this stuff, puts in all that money. And I got here and I realized that, yes, you can get Pokemons, augmented reality, Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, all of this stuff is here. However, as an ordinary citizen that has to deal with living here, I got one minute left. Um, it's, it's the 1950s. Um, when I, when, I, when I moved, I had to put my, first of all, I had to register my daughter to go to school here. I showed up, I had to show up with a photocopy of my electricity bill to prove I live here. I go, okay. Then when she had to take an ESL exam, I'm just sort of picking someone neutral here. She took the exam, she'd never studied, she'd never been, gone to school in an English speaking country, so she took the ESL exam and she aced it, and so she didn't have to take English as a second language, but I had to give her permission to go in an ordinary English class. So I signed two pieces of paper. One I was told to go and bring to the school. The other one I was told to drive three miles to the Palo Alto School District headquarters. I got there, there's a long line. I said, oh, well, I just have to hand, just, hand in a piece of paper, and the woman at the end of the line said, we all have to hand in a piece of paper. And she said, well, you see, you have to they have to make a photocopy of your piece of paper. I was like, what is this? Uh, at which point, I realized that in the United States, doing things you do as an ordinary citizen, um, it's the 1950s, except for the part where you have a photocopying machine in the school district headquarters because those came in in the US in the 1960s. But everything else could have been the 1950s. Uh, whereas, so we sit around, I mean, the guys who live here or the women who live here and deal with this and we go like, where are we? What is going on? Why is life in the 1950s here? This is Silicon Valley, you know, the mecca of everything in innovation. Well, it turns out it's not. And I would, and slowly other countries uh, around the world are beginning to understand this too. And they're kind of getting over this bizarre idea of saying, oh, we want to be the next Silicon Valley, which is kind of saying we want to be the, the next Rome or the next Paris or the next London or the next New York. Ain't gonna happen. But certainly what the United States does need is to figure out basic issues like identity and how you actually uh, create life I mean, make a better life for citizens interacting with the government. Thank you very much. I hope that all makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we, we have time, I think, for one question for President Ilvis. We'll be going into a panel session at the end. Uh, does anyone have a question? Let's see. Yeah. Yes, sir. What do you think is the, the, the root cause of the discrepancy between a really advanced innovation environment and a 19 Stage well, there is a bizarre sort of element in that uh, the, the five eyes countries, UK, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, are the five countries that are viscerally and fundamentally opposed to the, the core element that you need to have a digital society, which is a secure identity. If you don't have a secure identity, I mean, basically, you know, in, in the 1980s, you had this, uh, there was a thing called BitNet, which was a network of academics where you put in your email address and a password. That, that worked for 3,500 people. It was great. I was on it. Unfortunately, you have 4.2 billion people on the internet. Any password, simple password, can be brute force broken. So there's no point. I mean, every time you go, I mean, I do this all the time. I go on Amazon, I just like squint and go, okay, I'll order. Because all I do is have my, have my password and all my, all my data are there. Uh, now, we're not, I'm not even gonna get into Equifax, so anyway. Thank you, President Ilvis. Thank you.